there are some pluses from the point of view of the United States and American power in this period. If you look at Europe, Europe is going to be transformed by this war. Uh, Russia will probably be isolated for a very long time to come, and that's sad because Russians, at least since the time of Gorbachev, had begun to break out of their isolation. They traveled, you had them in classes, you, you know, they worked in foreign companies, and now uh, he's threatening to make it a, just a big North Korea. Uh, Russia has lost one million people, have fled the country. And it's sad because this is a really terrific people. They are creative, they are innovative, they're really smart, and the world would be better out with them than without them. And so one question is, can you separate Russians from Putinism and save that? Um, but the rest of Europe, uh, Europe has responded in a way that I think most people find even surprising. The energy landscape will change dramatically in Europe because the Germans uh, who were told from the time of Ronald Reagan not to become dependent on uh, Russian natural gas now recognize it was a bad idea to be dependent on Russian natural gas. You will see um, uh, them go to other sources. It'll be interesting to see uh, to the degree that hydrocarbons are a part of our future for a long time to come, and they are. Uh, we'd all like to see a, a, a carbon a transition from, uh, to a less carbon intensive world, but where will those hydrocarbons come from? Will it be through investment in the North American platform in the United States? Uh, there are fields in places like Mozambique and Algeria that we're not being able to get uh, investment. They will, Russia on the other hand, because they no longer will have access to the, the, um, to the technology from uh, the Exxons and the BPs of the world, those uh, fields in places like Sakhalin, which are very hard to get to and very old, uh, Russian production will decline. On the other hand, who would have thought it? Finland and, and Sweden? Uh, I used to worry about the Arctic. Well, we're kind of there at this point. And so the, uh, the expansion of NATO, um, as a friend of mine put it, Vladimir Putin managed to end German pacifism and Swedish neutrality in a matter of months. And so from the point of view of American alliances, they couldn't be stronger. True also in the Asia Pacific in response to China. Um, the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, whether it's Australia or AUKUS with Great Britain or uh, Japan, which has begun to reassess its uh, role in the world, to India, which is a complicated place, but a place where we have had a, I think, steady development of better relations uh, over time. Uh, you know, the Indians, just as an example, they have trouble buying our military equipment because we have all of these end user requirements, but they're buying from Australia and from Great Britain and from Israel. My view is that's okay. Team Blue is good. And so uh, relations with India are, I think, solidifying and improving. And then when you look at the rest of the world, uh, the so-called global south, as people call it, I think the real issue for the United States there is going to be to be careful not to have loyalty tests with people. This is even true with India. Uh, we uh, Americans have a kind of, uh, you know, for us or against us um, mentality sometimes, when actually if you will let countries go with their natural, uh, their, their natural interest, particularly in the case of in India, for instance, uh, they'll come your way because uh, does India really want to continue to be reliant on that Russian junk called military equipment? Do they really want to be reliant on the Russians when the Russians are in relationship with the Chinese, who's India's biggest problem? And so uh, I hear a lot about the global south um, and, and you know whose side are they on. It would be good if we didn't repeat the mistake of that led to the non-aligned movement of insisting that you have to be in one camp or the other. The other final thing that I'll say, um, and then we'll get to questions, is uh, you know we've been through tougher times before, actually, and uh, we have managed uh, to get through them because the United States has a lot of strengths. I think the biggest issue we face right now is probably ourselves. So I'm asked to talk about global hotspots, but any global hotspot can be dealt with uh, if the United States has the confidence to deal with them. And right now we're not too confident a country. 
And it comes, it thinks, from kind of internal pressures. And we can talk more about those. But uh, getting to the place that uh, Americans, again, are focused on what unites them, focused again on that sense that you know, it doesn't matter where you came from, matters where you're going, everybody can be a part of the dream, you will have a stronger impulse among American leaders to want to lead. Because when I hear the American people actually don't want to be involved in international politics, there are two things Americans carry in their heads simultaneously, and they're somewhat contradictory. One is, can't somebody else do this finally? We've been at this for a long time. Why can't somebody else step up? The other is, we can't live in a world where one country just tries to extinguish its smaller neighbor, or where Syrian children are choking on gas. And the president who decides to play to the impulse that says, well, yes, it would be nice if somebody else did it. There isn't anybody else to do it. It'll have to be us. I think uh, that's what I'm looking for when I listen to the upcoming debates. OK, with that, let's go. Oh, yeah, we've got plenty of questions. Good. OK, we're going to go one, two right here, and then I'll come to this section. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much for your talk, Secretary Rice. Uh, we really appreciate having you here. I don't know if you remember me, but I was here for your fireside chat last year with Betsy DeVos. Oh, okay. All right. I think I had a question about charter schools, but yeah. uh, that's for another day. Yeah. Uh, my main question is concerning the influence um, of social media on the culture of the United States. I know that when uh, TikTok and especially the pandemic came about, uh, many Americans were concerned about the national security risk that came with the usage of TikTok. Yeah. I wanted to know uh, your perspective on TikTok's, um, I suppose, security threats on the national level, as well as its influence on the, the culture of Americans and their, I suppose, impotence on the national stage. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, look, I'm really glad that there wasn't social media when I was secretary, because it makes life a lot harder. Um, and I think it has, look, it has a lot, of, a lot of value. And let's be real, Mark Zuckerberg just wanted to talk to his friends at Harvard. He didn't think he was going to be part of the uh, infrastructure of the country. And so I think social media is beginning to adjust to its role in the world, um, and we have to help it adjust. Um, when it comes to, I'm going to come back to one other point, by the way, but TikTok, I, I'm probably, as a national security person, I'm probably less worried about TikTok than most people. Um, I, I don't, I, yeah, it, does it dull people's brains? Yes. But if it weren't TikTok, something else would be dulling people's brains. And so our answer has to be, how do we get those little things out of our kids' hands so that they're not getting their brains dulled? Not is it TikTok that's doing it. I don't think the Chinese are sending subliminal messages uh, through, through TikTok. I will say on uh, the social media piece, one thing that worries me a lot is when we start talking about disinformation and you know, I, we, we accept things as fact way too quickly. Um, and incredible, sometimes fact becomes just you don't agree with me, so you aren't, you aren't following the facts. And so um, I've been encouraging people to be a lot, more, um, a, a lot more careful about what they declare a fact and, uh, and go ahead and debate people who may disagree. Right here. Yes. Hi, I'm Mafina from the University of Hong Kong, and I'm actually from Hong Kong. So when you talk about China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, I feel that in person. Yeah. The question I want to ask you, because your main theme of the book, Democracy, Stories from the Long World to Freedom, is about democracy yes. from the title. I wonder, do you think democracy is the right question to ask about Russia? Yes. Well, I do think democracy is the right question to ask about uh, any country, and there are a couple of reasons for it. One is the moral issue, right? Um, people ought to have a say in how their lives are going to develop. And uh, I believe that the values of saying what you think, worshiping as you please, being free of the knock of the secret police at night, and being able to choose those who are going to govern you is universal. Right? So that's the moral case. When it comes to the practical case, I just said it about authoritarians. Authoritarians don't, uh, uh, democracies don't do what Vladimir Putin just did. Democracies don't do what Xi Jinping is doing inside. Democracies make mistakes. But authoritarians, when you have one person who can decide the fate of his people, that's when you start to get the kinds of impacts that you have. Democracies don't uh, employ child soldiers because it would be all over the free press. Uh, democracies don't, um, don't threaten their neighbors because it would be all over the free press. 
And so I think there's both a practical case for democracy and a moral case for democracy. And usually the people who say, well, those people don't want democracy are the people who are lucky enough to live in one and then can talk about those people. So I don't think there is any people on the face of the earth, and I'm being very honest with you, I don't think there's any people on the face of the earth who would rather live in tyranny. And when you see what's happening in Chinese autocracy at this point, which is the one thing that China was delivering, which was prosperity, but they were of course delivering without rule of law, and so now prosperity is under undermined, um, I think we would be better off with democracies. Oh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I do have two questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm Ray from Taiwan, an in incoming student at Georgetown. So my first question, my, my two questions are actually not about Taiwan. I am sure someone else may ask that. So you might be aware of there's a lot of signs on the shift on US foreign policy. Part of that it's the shift from the Middle East to potentially Asia. Mm -hmm. And this given the time that uh, the Russia is have their decline influence due to the war. So I wonder, you know, such scenario is leave a strategic uh, void for yeah. China. So uh, how the U United States foreign policy should deal with such situation and how to manage the trade-off in foreign policy? Thank you. Uh, let, I'm going to just take one question, OK? okay and so you. others can ask. Uh, so I never liked the idea of the pivot to Asia uh, away from other parts of the world. The United States is a global power. And we actually have to be able to exercise our uh, interests and our values globally. And so uh, when you think about the Middle East, I understand that there was concern about you know, uh, two wars and, and uh, you know, the lack of democracy there and the Palestinians and Israelis, and I understand all that. But there's a, actually a new opportunity in the Middle East right now, thanks to the Abraham Accords. I think that the, um, the um, war of the, the, the Gulf Arabs are in the process of actually ending the state of war with Israel. And they're doing it not because they've suddenly awakened and loved the Jewish democratic state of Israel. They're doing it because they recognize that they have to diversify their economies, they, the 800-pound the gorilla in the Middle East in terms of technology is Israel. And the number of business, military, even intelligence relationships that are growing up in the Middle East, that web that's growing up, I think that's something that we ought to be actively supporting with our diplomacy. I've read that maybe the Biden administration is thinking about something like that. They should be. And that's why the, great, why the United States can't pivot to one place. When you're Secretary of State, you don't come in and say, OK, I think I'll just do Asia today. That's not how it works. You might plan, you're, be planning your trip to Asia, and all of a sudden there's a problem in Lebanon, and you've got to be there to deal with it. And so a great global power has to be able to do more than one thing. And when it comes to our military capabilities, um, I, I, we do need to rebuild our military industrial base, which is, has, uh, I think, continued to, to suffer. Um, and we do need to make sure that, for instance, we are, that the carrier uh, battle groups are able to deploy. You know, right now, apparently, we can only deploy one. That's a, that's a problem. Uh, but I don't think this is a matter of choosing. I don't think the United States has that, has that luxury. And you're right, if the United States tries to exercise that luxury, it will open up a path for somebody else. Okay, I'm gonna go all the way to the back, back there. Yeah, so thank you for your talk. I really appreciated it. Um, I do have one question. Um, whenever we're talking about the liberal international order that has kind of um, characterized the post-war um, history of the world. Um, I was just wondering, do you think it's based more on the ideas of the liberal international order or based more on the power, economic, military, yeah. Yeah. even diplomatic, of the United States? And how can it be maintained, if it's the latter, how can it be maintained as the U.S.'s share of GDP um, kind of continues to decline over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you have the idea first, and then uh, if you don't have the power, the idea doesn't matter. So I wrote an article once called A Balance of Power That Favors Freedom. And the point was that um, it, it's not, you know, if people want to distinguish you, you've studied political science, many of you, between realist and, uh, and um, 
some people call it idealism, that's not what they really mean, but between realist and uh, liberalism, or the search for what the internal character state should look like. Now, um, I think American policy, foreign policy, when it's at its best, has both of those elements. So it has a set of ideas about how it wants the international system to look. And by the way, great powers are not, they don't mind their own business. Right? Great powers want to shape the international system. And if you're shaping it around a set of ideas, you have to have the power and the assets to do that, military power, economic power, et cetera. I know this, the um, arguments about declining GDP, but um, it, you know, it's still the dominant uh, GDP. It now looks like China will not surpass. And I never worried that even if China did surpass, that it was going to surpass in a way that really mattered. And when you look at uh, things that we don't measure in GDP, like innovation, uh, for instance, like uh, how many uh, new companies are getting started, you can't measure that. I think the United States is still far and away uh, the dominant power. Uh, what I do worry about is that some of our strategic allies, I worry a lot about Europe in this regard. So if you look at where most of the innovation and technology is taking place, it's not in Europe. They're kind of two centers. It's the United States and it's, it's China. And I don't think that's a good place to be. So I probably worry more about the um, stagnation in European economies than about uh, our own. I mean, we have a lot of problems that we have to resolve and we shouldn't be borrowing so much money and spending money, we know all, that, all of that. But when you look in the kind of aggregate and when you look, uh, you take a 30,000 uh, foot view, uh, the United States still looks, looks pretty powerful. Um, I think the liberal order uh, is giving way because of other things, uh, largely because I think internally a lot of countries haven't been able to deliver and that's caused this kind of populist revolt. And you know, populism, protectionism, nationalism, uh, nativism kind of all come together. I, I used to call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so they tend to come together. Yes, right there. Hi, good morning, Secretary Rice. My name is Casey Jane Keast, and it's such an honor to hear from you this morning. Thank you. Um, I was curious, with your expertise on foreign policy, what are your current thoughts on the US giving more aid to Ukraine with the American people currently struggling? Border crisis, yeah. cities in ruin, et cetera. Yes, thank you. Yeah, again, I think great powers have to be able to do a lot. And um, on Ukraine, it's, it's, uh, we, we are giving a lot of aid, and we should be giving a lot of aid, but the Ukrainians are doing the fighting. And uh, they're doing the fighting to establish an extremely important principle that none of us want to live without, which is that small, big countries shouldn't extinguish their neighbors. Uh, and if it ever becomes okay that big powers can, can, can extinguish their neighbors, that's not a world that's gonna be very attractive. It's also the case that, uh, because of what I talked about earlier, you know, I really would ask any American politician who doesn't want to aid Ukraine to the point that they can, um, and, and you know, how they win or what win means, I think, is a, is, is a question. But anybody who wants to make that argument, I would say, how are you going to feel on the day when Vladimir Putin is on his victory lap with Xi Jinping, um, and you could have stopped it? I want to see you make that speech to the American people. Uh, that will make the speech after the disgraceful withdrawal from Afghanistan look like child's play. So um, I don't think uh, that they have a choice. We have a choice. Um, we will see just, you know, we'll see where this war is. Um, permafrost will start to set in late October, early November, uh, you know, Hitler and uh, Napoleon learned that you can't fight in that territory. Uh, you don't start a war in September in that territory. So I think it will be a question of where the battle lines are drawn then. Um, if the Ukrainians are able to break through to the Sea of Azov because you can't, what the Russians tried to do was to bisect Ukraine and leave it landlocked. And it's not viable if it's landlocked. It's viable if it can get through to the Black Sea. And so uh, at that point, I think we'll have a sense. But for now, I think we just have to give the Ukrainians the, um, what they need. I, I think the Biden administration's done, uh, done that. I would have done it faster. Um, it seems that every time, you know, first 
well, you know, we won't give them uh, long range uh, artillery. Well, then we did. Uh, we won't give them missile defense. Then we did. We won't give them tanks. Then we did. Uh, how about you just sort of decide, okay, whatever is we're going to need? Because the idea that you were somehow causing escalation with Putin always seemed not very smart to me. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to go to the middle, in, right here. You've got on the, yeah, you. Ma'am, good morning. Monty Alhassani, uh, active duty Army officer stationed in Hawaii, so dealing with a lot of the issues, of course, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, my question is a little bit different. So there's this theory that I've heard in the past that benevolent dictatorship can establish the steps to maybe a genuine democracy. So Singapore, uh, maybe a little bit further in the past, Turkey with Ataturk. To what extent do you believe in that, and how should the United States interact and integrate with countries in the developing world, especially in light of some of the geopolitics we're facing now? Uh, uh, the problem with benevolent dictators is they don't tend to stay benevolent. And they don't tend to know when to leave office, right? So if I could absolutely make a bet that, um, uh, you know, I actually probably the closest uh, in, in some ways was Singapore, uh, where, uh, you know, and it's a city state, right? It's very small. It's uh, not all that complicated, although ethnically it's complicated. And I don't think that there's any doubt that um, uh, the leadership there uh, was extraordinary. But you don't get that many leaders like that. And so usually what you get with dictators is you get people who rape and wreck the country on their own behalf. Uh, and then the country has to, be, has to recover from them before they start to get decent governments. So I, as a general principle, I don't think it works. In very specific circumstances, it may work. And so I wouldn't encourage it because I don't know the circumstances in which it's going to work and the circumstances in which it's not. I'll give you a very good example of this, uh, Museveni in, in Uganda. Right? Uh, we worked really well with Museveni around uh, AIDS, and he was a great partner. And, and then he got older. And he got more entrenched. And now he's just a dictator. And so I think that's more often the path than, you know, I mean, like I said, Lee Kuan Yews don't come along that often. And so um, I think we have to be careful in encouraging it. Hello, thank you so much for this talk. And just long story short, I'm from Russia. And thank you for having me here. I really appreciate that you do involve people like me. Here. Me too, yes. But I study in London, so basically I do some politics there. And I have a question. I don't want to ask any precise questions. I do have a lot. But uh, here, in this extraordinary setting, like a lot of people from different contexts, with different expertise and everything, like incredible people, what can we do? What, how could we act? And what's our mission here? Like maybe we should collaborate. Yes. <laughs> maybe we should come up with something. What can we do? Yes, thank you. Well, the first thing that you're doing is that you're showing interest and you're getting educated about it. You're learning. You're developing expertise. Um, I think with your generation, um, and it was probably true with my generation too, you're in a hurry to do things. Right? You, want, you want to make a difference. And you will. You'll make a difference because some of you will go and serve in, uh, in governments at some point in time. Some of you will go and hopefully take up the cause of people in your country who can't take up their own cause. In fact, that may be the most important thing that um, people can do, which is to speak for the voiceless. And you do that by, uh, of course, if you can work in an organization that does that and so forth, but there's nothing wrong with mobilizing other people to do that as well, <laughs> petitioning governments on behalf of having that happen. But at some point in time, and I'll speak specifically to Russia, at some point in time, the weight of the um, innovativeness and the creativity and the intelligence of the Russian people is going to create another opening for a different Russia. It was there a couple of times and it closed, but that doesn't mean it will close forever. And so I hope that more people like you 
will continue to be in our universities, whether they're in London or here, uh, so that you can prepare for that time. Now, I was, as I said, I was um, in the government when the Soviet Union fell, when uh, the Baltic states, which had been forcibly incorporated into the uh, Soviet Union uh, and in 1941, and had lived in captivity for all those years, when conditions changed, they were ready. They had a strong diaspora. The first presidents of the Baltic states actually had lived in places like Canada and the United States and other places, but they were ready uh, to go back. And so um, I know that uh, being in exile, in a sense, is not uh, a pretty picture. But um, I just want to give you confidence that I think the time for Russia will come again. And that's why we've got to keep bringing I have many Russian students, I've trained many Russian students, got to keep coming and being a part of the uh, world here so that they are prepared to go back. Uh, good morning, Dr. Rice. Thank you for coming. It's a privilege to uh, see you today. Your friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Madeleine Albright, once remarked that uh, foreign policy is much like a game of billiards, you know, causes and many effects. Recently on um, Uncommon Knowledge, which was produced here, of course, with Peter Robinson, you said, and it's a rough quote, I was thinking of it as it was sitting here, but, you know, Russia has been plagued by 300 years of bad politics, and that has led to their um, aversion to democracy. Um, given that, you know, that view, what can we do as Americans, as a great power, to promote democracy in our interest and in the interest of the Russian people um, in Russia? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you're right. I said 300 years of, of bad politics uh, by political leaders, not by the Russian people who uh, don't deserve what they've gotten in political leadership. You know, I continue to think that um, we have to keep pressure on the Putin regime. Um, there is a story, I think it was yesterday, that um, you know, the ruble is really now final, finally sinking. Uh, this really, really good central banker that they've had, uh, Navalina, uh, he's now turned to blaming her, saying it was loose money that's causing the problem. Um, and so you have to keep pressure on the Putin regime um, because ultimately um, they can't, he won't be able to fight this war forever. I used to say that he, uh, time was on his side. I, I don't think so anymore, both by the turbulence inside his own uh, inner circle and because of what's starting to happen to the economy. But I think we help Russians or Ukrainians or any people who are, particularly those who are uh, trying to find their way toward democracy in two ways. One is, as I said, have people, I keep saying we have to have Russian students here. We have to have Russian PhDs in our programs. We have to bring Russian scientists. We, that people to people piece is important. But the second I'll make an argument is more philosophical. The United States of America gets impatient with people who are trying to make the journey to democracy. We got impatient with the Afghans. We get impatient with the Iraqis. We get impatient with the Russians. Well, maybe they just don't have the DNA. And uh, there are no people on the face of the earth who don't have the DNA. Right? There, was, there was once a time when Germans were too martial. Well, they seem to have done all right with democracy. When I used to teach a course in the, back in the 1980s, believe it or not, on civil military relations, I could always teach about some Latin American junta. They don't have juntas anymore. People used to say Latin Americans preferred cadillos. No. Uh, Africans were supposed to be too tribal. Well, there's some functioning, flourishing democracies in Africa. And so, and, and by the way, Asian societies, you know, too Confucian and too, well, you know, Few of them are doing okay, including Taiwan. And so I think you have to, uh, as, as an American leader, as an American government, recognize that democracy is actually really hard. I'm often asked, why do democracies fail? I think it's more interesting that they succeed because you're asking human beings to set aside clan and family and, and individual and trust these abstractions, institutions, elections, and constitutions, and, and rule of law, 
And that takes time. And oh, by the way, the United States of America, more than any country on the face of the earth, ought to recognize this. Because it's taken us a really long time, and we're still trying to live up to the words of 1776 and 1789. And so why we become so impatient with others, I remember doing a, um, I was uh, testifying in, before Congress, and uh, we were talking about the Afghan Constitution, and the Afghan Constitution starts out by saying we will obey both individual rights and Sharia law. Right? So everybody goes, uh, what does that mean? And the senator says, well, you know, he says, uh, that's a terrible compromise. How could you ever have agreed to that compromise? And I said, you know, senator, it's not half as bad as the compromise that made my ancestors three-fifths of a man so that you could go ahead and sign a constitution. So the United States, maybe more than any country in the world, ought to be patient and prepare and help people prepare for the day when that opening comes. Okay, thank you.